I want to think back to some of the conversations earlier today around trust and identity, and but I'd like pivot a little bit and, and talk about some of the roles that employers can play in trying to improve health equity and like what are the levers. Um, and I'm going to approach today's discussion from the perspective of a large employer, in this case the University of Michigan, which is actually the largest employer in the state of Michigan. Um, it's actually bigger than the autos at this point because the autos, of course, are not just in Michigan. They're all over. Um, we have about somewhere between 50 and 60,000 employees, uh, full range of, of salaries and wages and health issues. Um, we cover um, about 115,000 lives. So when we think about benefit design, you know, there are some things you can do around this. And um, I, I um, have the honor of serving as the university's chief health officer. And in that role, I'm a key advisor to our university president, who actually happens to be a physician on all aspects of health and well-being for students, faculty, and staff. And I've actually really been interested in the staff piece and the health equity piece, because I think it gets overlooked. There's a lot of attention to the students, a lot of attention to the faculty, but we don't always think about the staff, who are often with us for 30, 40, 50 years. And so it, it, um, it does matter. So like a lot of large employers, you know, University of Michigan is self-insured. Um, and that gives us a certain amount of flexibility in terms of how benefits might be structured and what care and um, services might be covered and not covered. And something unique about Michigan is that we're also a very large health system. And we also have many faculty investigators from the whole spectrum of health uh, sciences who are interested in this. So we have public health and dental and nursing and social work, but we also have law and business and uh, policy. So we have a huge range of people who touch on different aspects. Education is another one um, on this. And so what, what, what we try to do is try things, measure them, sort of evaluate, and, and report them. Because I think that things that work at Michigan can work in a lot of places. Uh, so I have this first photo here, which is um, in the big house. It's one of my favorite places. And I think that this is sort of what people think of when they think about employee well-being. They think about you know yoga in the big house, which is really great. And it is important. And the sense of community that it br brings is actually very important. But that's not health equity. You know? And so I want to sort of bridge that issue. Um, so why? Why are employers important in this discussion? Why do they matter? Well, in the United States, most people, especially those who are under 65 and who are not children, are, uh, depend on employer-sponsored health, health plans. So for employers, there's a big economic issue here because you're paying health benefits. Uh, but it's also really important economically to have a healthy workforce. And on the flip side, uh, money spent particularly on prevention and and other services can have a long-term savings in terms of your health plans. Uh, and although health insurance benefits might be equitable, and, and uh, uh, Germain, he might be out, um, he talked about that, having an insurance card doesn't guarantee you care. Um, and in fact, um, in health insurance may be, benefits may be very equitable. And in fact, um, people have very similar coverage and some of the lower lowest wage workers might even be subsidized to cover that. Uh, but use of this benefit, these benefits varies. And I'm going to show you data to show this, that the use is not equitable. And that's, I don't have the answers to how to fix that, but I'm going to show you some examples. Um, and I am going to focus on wage as sort of socioeconomics as, as sort of a common thread today. Um, so before getting into healthcare spending and patterns, I, I'd actually like to take a few minutes and just talk more simply about the association between income and life expectancy in the United States. And I'm not going to spend too much time here. Um, uh, it, it might be a little hard to, to see, but there's a couple just big take-home messages. So the relationship between income and life expectancy is well established, uh, but the reasons why is poorly understood. And this is a landmark article. It was published in 2016 by Raj Chetty and colleagues in um, JAMA. And uh, it was right, actually, it was at the time uh, of the, the 2016 election. So there was a lot of interest around income equity, in inequity, and uh, many of the campaigns actually reached out to him to, to talk about these data. And basically what they found, and this is just the, this is kind of from, very hard to read, but I, I think I have it um, written out here, so I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, but in the United States, between 2001 and 2014, higher income was associated with greater longevity, and differences in life expectancy across income groups increased over time. 
However, the association between life expectancy and income varied substantially across geographic areas, and I'll show you that. And, um, and basically, health behaviors and, and local area characteristics were important. So this is a, just an incredible work. It's uh, like one and a half billion person years, and it's just you know a lot of data. For those of you who like data like I do, this is a great article to look at. It's like 17 pages long, but it's really great reading. Uh, it has a number of editorials and stuff, and I'll, I can, uh, I'll tweet out the article later uh, for those of you who w would like to read it. Um, and this is, again, you don't have to look at this very closely to see this graph of income along the bottom and uh, longevity. And you can see that when you make more money, you live longer. And women live longer than men. And that difference is pretty substantial, and it remains substantial throughout life. So just seeing that image. Um, but depending on where you live, some of this can be mitigated. And again, this is, take a quick look at this graph. Uh, there's men and women. Um, on the left is uh, the lowest wage groups. And there are a number of cities there. There's New York City, San Francisco, Dallas, and then my hometown, Detroit. And Detroit actually fares the worst. I'm sad to say that. But it, um, and I think actually these data have really inspired a lot of work at the state level and at the city level to try to improve some of this gap. But basically, if, um, if you are poor, but you live in a better resourced place, some of, this, um, some of this inequity can be improved. And so I'm just kind of showing this as background because I think everyone in this room is so committed to these issues and this was such an important landmark article. Um, so getting back to our question, which is what role can employers play in efforts to address health disparities and improve access to care? And you know, again, this access piece I think is really important part of the puzzle. You have health insurance, but are you really accessing care? Um, so this is another article I wanted to share, and I'll also uh, share this by Twitter for anyone interested. This is from Bruce Sherman. This was published in 2017, and it's titled, Healthcare Usage and Spending Patterns Vary by Wage Level in Employee-Sponsored Plans. And they looked at about uh, 43,000 employees at four companies that were self-insured. So, you know, good-sized employer, you know, employers, uh, what most people would consider large employers. And they divided the wage groups into five categories with the lowest wage earners, being um, uh, you know, sort of 24,000 uh, at the low end and then uh, 70,000 and above at the high end. And so there were uh, several, uh, several groups in between. And basically what they found is that uh, the lowest group had about half the amount of preventive care. Um, the, I can barely read this, but uh, you can see it, it's uh, they're basically twice, twice the hospital admission rate. Um, and uh, uh, you know, much higher avoidable admissions. I'm going to show you the data in, in graphic form because it's quite dramatic. It was actually like four times, so avoidable admissions, very expensive and, and just bad for everybody. Um, and then um, the other thing that was very sensitive was emergency department visits. So, you know, that's again a marker of access, right? If you're going to the emergency department for things that could be taken care of in a primary care setting, it's, um, it's not good for anybody. Um, these are these are the slides, and you know this first one is just looking um, at it, it's you know you can see it's a like a beautiful graph going up over time, um, and looking at all the issues I mentioned, you know the, the hospitalizations and uh, use of care. Here's a couple that I think are are even um, better to look at, and again the high wage is on the right, and you could see. Again, this is difficult to see, but you can see there's, I mentioned there's like about fourfold higher emergency department visits. And um, this isn't just like young people who make a little bit of money and like break their leg and go to the emergency department because there's a high rate of hospitalization. And so that's why I don't think it's, it, although the data aren't totally adjusted for age, um, it's not as simple as um, these are just young people and they, they, they needed to get emergency care. This is avoidable emergency care. And the other, the line on top is uh, prescription use. And so you can see here that prescription use is actually higher in the higher wage. And is it because they have more conditions? I'm not sure when the hospitalization rate is higher in the lowest income. So you can sit and think about this. And, um, uh, and then this is the last one. And I think this, um, this is really relevant to some of the conversations we've had today. This is on prevention. And this is mostly cancer screenings. And I know this is a topic of interest to a number of people in this room, and you've done a lot of work to try to bridge some of these gaps. But, and this is eligible individuals. This isn't 
all individuals. This is like people who would be eligible for colon cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, and um, um, so it's colon, breast, and, and cervical. And you could see that the highest wage uh, earners are getting are, are getting um, the most preventive care. And so you know that's that's um, really concerning. And the reasons are not simple, but I want to show it to you graphically. So I'm going to look at some data at the University of Michigan. Um, and I mentioned we have um, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60,000 employees. We cover more than 100,000 lives. And these are our numbers. And this is 2017 data. Not everyone has health insurance. Some just don't want it, or some have uh, other forms of health insurance. And um, I want to draw your attention to a couple numbers here. Under net medical payments, the numbers are about equal. And that's the case also with the Sherman data. Uh, their numbers were about 5,000, and that included um, you know, sort of over the whole range, and we're at closer to 4,000 plus uh, pharmacy payments. So around 5,000, so pretty similar. The numbers look almost the same, but the distribution is different. And unfortunately, this, uh, this got a little shifted. I tried very hard to line everything up, um, but that's okay. And I'm just gonna read through this. Preventive visits, different. Um, other visits, mental health, Emergency department, sort of the exact same thing. Inpatient uh, uh, admissions, this is important. There were more, first of all. And then uh, the days of admission were longer. So not only were you more likely to be admitted, but you were also there longer. And again, the raw data, they're not, they're not controlled for age or chronic conditions, but the number mirrors exactly what we saw in the Sherman data. And these are contemporary data. This isn't you know something from 2001. This is 2017 at the University of Michigan. So that's how I want to just sort of stage this. Um, and here's a, here's a summary. Um, basically, I'm, I'm trying hard to read this. <laughs> um, higher, uh, so basically, similar overall healthcare spending, I mentioned that. Um, the lower income workers had uh, less preventive visits. Um, very importantly, fewer mental health and substance use visits. Uh, oh, thank you. Look at that. And uh, lower income uh, workers, more emergency department visits. So, like again, with similar to Sherman data, and uh, more you know, sort of more use of inpatient services. So, kind of just very broad brushstrokes, um, but important and contemporary data. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about our employee well-being. One of my roles is also to I serve as an advisor, medical director for our benefits team, our, our um, employee well-being, occupational health. So I'm, I'm sort of in a lot of disability. So I'm in lots of spaces, and I'm really thinking about this issue holistically. And I'm also thinking about it as an economic issue and a diversity, equity, and inclusion issue, because I think they go hand in hand. It's good for us as an employer to have healthy employees. It's good for our employees to be healthy for all the reasons that everyone in this room understands. Um, this is uh, our model of well-being. Depending on how old you are, this is either a pinwheel or um, pedals. Um, I think of it as a pinwheel. <laughs> but you know, the idea that health and well-being isn't just physical health and uh, emotional health. This is like Alma was talking about today. You know, that idea of the whole person. And we think about these eight aspects of well-being. I wanted to point out some that maybe we don't always think about, which is financial well-being. That's one of the important pedals. Uh, occupational well-being, you know, as well as spiritual, environmental. And you can look at it so based on the SAMHSA model. And people have different models on this, but this is ours, and we, we try to brand a lot of stuff with it. And, and we try to think about these different um, aspects of well-being when we do programming, too. Um, lately, we have been thinking a lot about social determinants of health in our employee well-being. And, um, uh, I think, again, folks in this room, we have, I've heard that term mentioned over and over. But again, this is the idea that where you live, where you were born, where you work, where you worship, where you age, that, that matters. And I think we have a, can, do we have a video? Yes. This is from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Just quick.
Okay, well, that's for all the, I know there are a lot of public health people here, and again, everyone repping. Uh, uh, and and you know, the idea is, is that intentional addressing of social determinants of health can actually improve health for everyone. And so with that, and this is, this is just another um, um, pie graph. This is from the University of Wisconsin. And you know, I just want to point out that actually the largest portion of this pie comes from that social and economic factors. You know, it's not just access to care. It's not just health behaviors. It's not like, you know, what you're eating and how you're exercising. It's actually the social determinants of health. And by, not, by addressing social determinants of health in a really thoughtful way as an employer, you can actually make um, a difference. And so we're thinking, and this is a, a diagram that my colleagues made, you know, this again, this idea that we have vulnerable patient populations for different reasons. Um, it might be low wage earners. It might be the physical demands of a job. It might be nurses who had to lift people. It might be um, people who are outside in the coldest days. Um, individuals with chronic conditions. This is something we're thinking a lot about, like what are we spending the most money on? It's diabetes, it's cancer, it's other, um, other conditions that are high cost. And then, um, other indiv individuals with other high-risk behaviors. And I, I think of um, issues around opioids as being part of that. And we've had uh, a lot of efforts at the state level in Michigan to try to address that. Um, so we're doing a number of things as an employer. And it, you know, we're doing the yoga in the big house, for sure. Um, but we're also, we hired a resource coach, a success coach, to, to work with employees. And it's some, she's a social worker. If you don't have a ride to work or you're having difficulty with childcare, she can help. Um, even uh, you might have a family member that's eligible for SNAP benefits, but the process of ap applying is, is difficult and challenging. She can help with that. Um, she just started a couple weeks ago, but we modeled this based on what another uh, employer has used and thinking about our own at the University of Michigan Poverty Solutions uh, Initiative, you know, thinking about resource coaches, success coaches. Um, we are doing a number of things around food and food security. Um, some of the staff at one of the clinics felt pretty frustrated, and I'm, I'm looking over at Mercy, um, my colleague from Michigan in Ypsilanti at Maggie's Marketplace. Um, one of the physicians at this clinic you know, recognized that we were telling people to go eat healthy and eat this kind of diet, but they were having difficulty accessing food, so they partnered with one of the local organizations that does um, a lot of work in food security and food banks. And they have uh, a, a lovely, um, they call it Mar Maggie's Marketplace name for the medical director who, who championed it. And at the same time, they realized that a lot of their employees had food security issues too. So some of the things that M Healthy, our, our employee well-being uh, services has done is make sure that um, we, we bring produce there. We're doing produce drop-offs and we're also trying to bring resources there um, the best example of this I have is the tobacco consult to service, which there are evidence-based ways to decrease your dependence on cigarettes or other forms of nicotine. And every day I drive in and I see, you know, we're smoke-free um, and the health system is actually tobacco-free, but you have people who are smoking in this designated area and they're often wearing matching uniforms. They have big black M's on them. And, you know, if, um, if they don't know that the resource is there, or they can't get to it, then shame on us. If that they just don't, aren't interested, then that's okay. Um, I think we can continue to try to address these issues. I think we can address them in other touch points like occupational health, at health fairs. So we're trying to think more actively, not just saying, hey, we have this, but making sure we try to make the connections. Um, the other place that we have a lot of activity is in our employee assistance program. Um, it's called Office of um, workplace Counseling and Resilience. The name was changed, and we also have an equivalent office. And again, this is psychological services for employees. Um, they can be seen a certain number of times. Their family members can be seen. But we're finding that they sometimes don't go and get additional counseling because it's expensive, it's hard. And so we're thinking about even like the co-pays. Are co-pays a barrier? Is that the only barrier? It may not be. How is telehealth, um, uh, how does that fit? And so we're really trying to rethink how we're doing things. And then, like I said, to measure it, evaluate it, and report it, because one size is not going to fit all. So I'm going to share an example. Um, and I wrote here, can thoughtful benefit design help address access and equity? And I'm going to show you an example from the University of Michigan. Um, this was actually published today in, in JAMA. It went up electronically. Um, you might see from my bio, I'm an editor there. I was not an author on this, but I asked them to 
get it up online a little early so I could present it here. <laughs> so they were kind enough to do that. Um, this is from Jim Dupree and colleagues. He's a urologist at Michigan. And um, in 2013, one of the graduate students at Michigan inquired about IVF coverage. And IVF coverage was not part of the benefits plan at that point. And um, there was a lot of discussion. The Medical Benefits Advisory Committee talked about it and decided to do a three-year pilot and say, let's cover this uh, and let's see what happens. And um, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's just a very short paper. It's 600 words. It's a letter. And I would have you take a look at it. Um, and basically, and I know no one can read this, um, but the thing that happened, and um, I think, you know, again, it's an example of can you can you build equ uh, you know can you build equity in is what was happening before, and although they didn't they didn't have claims for IVF, they had claims for a lot of other things that go with IVF for anyone who works in this field. Um, they could tell that women had probably had IVF based on certain testing and, and certain medications. And what they found is that there was like a very, very low rate of IVF use among the lowest wage workforce. But after this benefit came in, the largest increase was there. And the absolute rate still stayed highest in the high ones, um, but the difference really almost went away. And I, I would like to um, have you look at the, the data, the absolute rates. So there were a bunch of rules that were put around it, like the number of, you know, the age and like how many embryos were transferred. Um, there was a 20% coinsurance. Um, there was a maximum lifetime. And the other piece, which was a little bit controversial, was that you had to get your care at Michigan. Um, and they just did that because it was a pilot and they were going to figure out what, what was going to happen. But basically the results showed an increased use uh, among all women with the largest proportional increase among those with the lowest salaries. And I, I think, um, you know, that's, that's pretty special. We were talking about parenting today, and Jermaine talked about it. I actually am um, a mother also of um, two young, young adults. Um, well, one young adult, one, <laughs> one like who thinks she, not quite. Um, but you think about um, how, how meaningful that is to provide someone with the opportunity to, to grow their family. Now, this is not cancer screening. It's not like basic needs. Um, it's a high expense, high resource thing, but it's equity. And I show it because it's been so elegantly documented by Jim and his colleagues. And, and I just think like, can we apply this to other things? And I'm just uh, give you a couple examples. We had a similar discussion around um, um, transgender uh, care benefits. And the discussion again came from some graduate students. It's amazing. Like the graduate students, they, they really drive advocacy and they make us think about it. Although um, a lot of services were covered, um, facial feminization was not covered uh, um, for, for transgender women. And so this was something that was brought up and there was a lot of discussion. And in the end, they said, we're going to do this. It's the right thing to do. Um, health equity, this is a group of individuals who um, do not have good health outcomes for a lot of reasons, and let's do our part. And we're going to measure it, and we're going to see what happens. And uh, I'm going to reach out to one of our faculty who has a, a deep interest in this area to help us with the evaluation. Um, and so the question is, can we, can we do other things? Um, yeah, this is, yep, so I think I'm going backwards. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, this is sort of my last. So there's a compelling economic case for employers to be strong partners in health equity, uh, especially those are, that are self-insured, which at least as of right now, this is the, still the model in the United States. Um, that may change. Um, I, I think one of the big take-home messages that you saw in the Sherman data and you saw in our data is that simply having good benefits and access is not enough. Um, and we see this with preventive services, which I think really bothers me. I know there's some folks here who who study this, and I'm I'm actually really interested. You know, it's it's hard to go and get a colonoscopy if you're if you're going to miss work, or you might miss a couple days of work with that, or if no, you don't have anyone to drive you home. And so, what are you know what are some things that we can be doing as an employer? Um, and then, of course, other health behaviors overall. What can we do in the environment? And I you know I think again we are doing all those, but I'm really interested in sort of thinking of us as a driver of of equity really through benefits change. And so I'm I'm going to end there. I'd love to take some questions. I'm I, think, I think I caught us up. I think you almost caught us up. So we have time for <coughs> I'm also happy to share any of these slides if, if do you have a way Great. to do that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because it, it's hard to see them here. 
it's a little difficult to see them here. Yeah. So I think maybe I'll just kick off a question. One of the things we talked about early on um, when we were talking about this, thinking about this talk, was that there is a um, there's a big difference between equality and equity. And what you're really working on is you have people who have mostly equal yes. health insurance, yes. but they don't have equitable health insurance, and they also don't use it the same way. That's correct. So if you could just talk about yeah. that. Yeah, and, and um, so in fact, most people have the, the exact same product. We, we do offer multiple products, but almost everyone is uh, enrolled in the, it's, it's like sort of the, one of the best HMOs you can be in, but it is a HMO product through, um, managed through Blue Cross Blue Shield. So people have good access. About two-thirds of the care overall is at Michigan Medicine. People can get their care elsewhere. Um, and I'm just struck by the fact, to me, um, I feel like that primary care entry point is sort of the entry point to all of this. It isn't like, hey, go get a colonoscopy. It's like, no, go talk to your primary care provider, whether it's a physician or a nurse practitioner or, or someone else, and, and like kind of get back on, on track um, and so that's one of the pieces is how do you do that? And would it help to give people paid time off yeah. to, 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 to go mm -hmm. and do this? And so that, those are the kind of things we're thinking about. Like the fact that you can work in a hospital every day and then not take care of yourself. And I think this applies to also high wage people too. So, you know, sort of how do you make that easier? And, you know, can you come up with some new model? Question, but just a comment, and I, I want to say thank you for bringing this to to light. Because as my colleague and I were talking, you get time off for jury duty, yes. but no one thinks about. I don't know if anybody's had a colonoscopy before, yeah. but that that's like a two day it prep. Is. Is I mean, and so prep. if you work an hourly job to prep for that, is almost impossible yep. to be at work. And then, as you said, having someone drive you there. So I, I think. What you're presenting, at least to me, is not just a change within the healthcare system, but a change in the entire paradigm of how we view the importance of taking care of yourself. That there should be more um, equity around the fact that I can get time off to serve my jury duty, but I can't get the same time off to take care of myself. And I, I just think that it's fantastic that you not only have brought this to the forefront, but you've shown data mm -hmm. that shows yeah. how how we can do this and the benefits of doing that for people. Yep. So it just, I think it's incredibly important. Great, thank and you. And you're in D.C. So I yeah. mean, we just need to figure out how to expand it beyond yes. the walls yes. of this building yep. and just a few blocks over to the Capitol to let those folks understand. Yeah. There's not much going on there today. No, so. right, exactly. They're dealing with some other stuff, but, but thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that comment. And I think that that is it. It's, um, and, and again, uh, hats off to Jim Dupree, my colleague, for, for publishing this. And the first time I heard it, I said, you know, this is really important. And you need to publish it in a very high-level place. Don't just tuck it into some OBGYN journal, uh, because then you're not going to get the broad audience. I mean, that wasn't meant to slight any OBGYNs, but um, I think we really need we need people there and people here and people in the clinic to read this. And and I think it gets at the issue of just measuring and and, and not being afraid to fail. Um, I think uh, I think the paid time off piece. I've have been um, pushing for it also for the tobacco consult service because it happens to be located in a place where you have to drive. And our parking situation is, I mean, for a small uh, town, a Midwestern college town, it's, it's like New York City. It's become almost impossible to park um, on, on uh, the medical campus. And I think we just need to do better. And I think as an employer, we need to look at this as savings. Because again, when you look at the numbers, we're, we're, we're paying for it in um, you know, inappropriate ER use and inappropriate admissions or longer admissions. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> can you join, please, can everybody please join me in thanking Kute Milane?